Section 22 of the American Book of the Dog. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones. The American Book of the Dog. G. O. Shields, Editor. Section 22. The Smooth Coated Fox Terrier by August Belmont, Jr. I have been earnestly and repeatedly requested by the editor of this book to write an article on the Fox Terrier. I declined at first for want of time, and because I felt that someone else might do the work in a more finished manner than I, and would gladly have persisted in this course, but was led to consider it my duty to undertake the task because I represent so important an interest in the breed, and because I desire to do everything possible to promote its growth in public favor. This beautiful species of terrier is, it must be admitted, better and more widely understood and appreciated at his home in England than here in America. On this side of the water his popularity has but just begun, and his early history has been more ably treated by English writers than it is possible for an American to treat it. It will therefore suffice for the purposes of this article to give a general sketch of the Fox Terrier's early history, which at best is somewhat vague a description of its characteristics, as condensed a review as possible of the principal strains and a brief survey of what we possess here in America on which to found a worthy branch of a now magnificent breed in Great Britain. Terriers corresponding to the present fox terrier, both wire-haired and smooth, have undoubtedly existed for several centuries, although they were, as far as any allusion to them can be found in the works of early writers, on sporting matters classed and spoken of under the general term of terrier, a corrupted word derived from their Latin appellation terrarius, indicating their propensity to hunt underground. The characteristics of the terrier, whether of one species or another, were in the main the same as they are today, viz. a natural inclination to hunt and destroy vermin of any kind pursuing it to its refuge wherever it be within the terrier's power to reach it. This trait, being accompanied by a sprightly and tense nervous nature, keen sense of hearing, quick vision, a most unerring nose, and an indomitable gameness. This last quality must not be misunderstood as it often is when applied to this breed. Bulldog tenacity is not wanted in a dog bred and used for the purposes for which the fox terrier is most popular, and therefore should not be an attribute. Being intended to hunt with and for his master, he should be ready and eager to attack the object of the hunt, entering into its hiding place and indicating the locality by giving tongue or drawing out the game into the open it is not desirable that he should close with and kill the game as a bull terrier would do of course the fox terrier will do this eventually as he should as a last resort or if urged to by its master this style of hunting and fighting requires great dash courage and dexterity in trying to succeed in this method of helping to secure the animal hunted, he is often compelled to receive more punishment than if his tactics were purely a light to kill. His nose is keener for general game than that of any other breed of terrier. He was often used by gamekeepers in bygone days, and even by some of them in modern times, to do the work of a spaniel. It is clearly established that in accordance with the special preferences of individual sportsmen in early times for hunting certain animals so they unquestionably selected bred and used in accordance with their size and make up the terriers best suited
to each animal hunted, from the fox and the otter down to the common rat. For the fox, therefore, a dog about the size and general confirmation of the fox terrier of today, weighing from sixteen to eighteen pounds, was undoubtedly employed, and old prints and paintings now and then met with illustrate terriers of this form in a moderately accurate way. As fox hunting came in vogue in England and grew in popularity, we find attached to the kennels terriers which are progenitors of the present fox terrier. They appear to have been bred, however, for use only, and aptitude for their work must have been paramount to beauty, as most old paintings and prints illustrating the bolting of foxes from their earth by dogs represent, as a rule, rather dark and not prettily marked terriers, often with prick ears. Here and there a clue is given by some author or artist to white and pied terriers, both smooth and rough-coated, but there is no such thing as an absolute and exact type traceable in the fox terrier, as is the case with greyhounds and different species of hounds used in the chase for centuries past. It will have to satisfy the fox terrier lover who desires to establish the claim of his pet breed to purity of blood to say that the best foxhound kennels in the beginning of the century were possessed of good terriers and are known to have given their breeding the most careful attention so that when recourse was had to such kennels as the grove belvoir and corn to the bill of the present breed of fox terriers upon terriers were easily found in and about these kennels as true in type as the best of to-day although perhaps not so perfect in the special points which breeding purely for the bench shows has since produced during the early part of the century the indications are that the terrier which accompanied the earth stopper or the pack was often dark in color i have myself an old print of eighteen twenty five which i found at oxford ten years ago representing sir tatton sykes hounds drawing covert in the lower corner is depicted the earth stopper spade in hand watching the workings of the hounds with an excellent pale colored black and tan terrier by his side good drop ears straight legs though apparently standing a little higher from the ground than is desirable at the present time the history of the fox terrier resolves itself into three periods the first dating from about the sixteenth century to the end of the eighteenth during which time we have evidence of his existence along with the rest of the genus terrier bred in the stable yard and by gamekeepers as a rural plebeian master then the fox terrier graduates and we read careful descriptions of him and records of his having been bred with great care but for work primarily in connection with well-established and conducted packs of foxhounds in england ranking as a necessary adjunct of the hunt down to the middle of the present century at this time the country was rapidly becoming more open the pace growing very much faster and the chase and preservation of the fox much more artificial in consequence the little fox terrier's vocation seems to be on the wane and his future in doubt at the end of this the second period of his history we find him suddenly about eighteen sixty three attracting the attention of the general public at the then budding dog shows of birmingham leeds manchester and other midland and northern cities he is immediately taken up by the fancier and from that time begins the third and great period of his history with all its modern adjuncts noble lineage jealous and active competition among his patrons research and study of the past for evidences of his royal blood prominence in the sporting prints of the day and later journals and magazines especially devoted to his interests an insatiable demand springs up for him from every quarter resulting in most princely prices being paid 
and, last but not least, associations formed by men of means and prominence to intelligently perpetuate and improve his type. The fancier's first care was, naturally enough, directed to the typical kennel terrier of the day, keeping in view symmetry and the accepted features of his anatomy which his vocation and selection in breeding had produced. In the hands of breeders, in riders of good hunters, and the huntsmen and masters of crack packs of hounds, the fox terrier was in no small degree bred to agree in general conformation and type with both hunter and hound. The same hard and continuous work in all sorts of weather being required of all three. The earlier judges at the shows followed this idea, and the fanciers, through the Fox Terrier Club, later adopted a standard which confirms this, and which has been incorporated in the rules of the American Fox Terrier Club, and is today the standard according to which the Fox Terrier is judged at all shows in the United States and Great Britain. Some twelve years ago, a cloddy, shorthorn pattern of terrier found a passing support, but was soon dropped without greatly damaging the breed. Standard and Scale of Points of the American Fox Terrier Club Head and Ears 15 Stern 5 Neck 5 Legs and Feet 20 Shoulders and Chest 15 Coat 10 Back and Loin 10 Symmetry and Character 15 Hind Quarters 5 for a total of 100. Disqualifying points. 1. Nose, white, cherry, or spotted to a considerable extent with either of these colors. 2. Ears, prick, tulip, or rose. 3. Mouth, much undershot or much overshot. The skull should be flat and moderately narrow, and gradually decreasing in width to the eyes. Not much should be apparent, but there should be more dip in the profile between the forehead and top jaw than is seen in the case of a greyhound. The cheeks must not be full. The ears should be V-shaped and small, of moderate thickness, and drooping forward close to the cheek, not hanging by the side of the head like a foxhound's. The jaw, upper and under, should be strong and muscular, should be of fair punishing strength, but not so in any way to resemble the greyhound or modern English terrier. There should not be much falling away below the eyes. This part of the head should, however, be moderately chiseled out, so as not to go down in a straight slope like a wedge. The nose, toward which the muzzle must gradually taper, should be black. The eyes and the rims should be dark in color, small, and rather deep-set, full of fire, life, and intelligence. As early as possible, circular in shape. The teeth should be as nearly as possible level, i.e. the upper teeth on the outside of the lower teeth. The neck should be clean and muscular, without throatiness, of fair length, and gradually widening to the shoulders. Shoulders should be long and sloping, well laid fine at the points, and clearly cut at the withers. Chest deep and not broad. Back should be short, straight, and strong, with no appearance of slackness. Loin should be powerful and very slightly arched. The fore ribs should be moderately arched, the back ribs deep, and the dog should be well ribbed up. Hind quarters should be strong and muscular, quite free from droop or crouch, the thighs long and powerful, hocks near the ground, the dog standing well up on them like a foxhound, and not straight in the stifle. Stern should be set on rather high and carried gaily, but not over the back or curled. It should be of good strength, anything approaching a pipe-stopper tail, 
being especially objectionable. Legs viewed in any direction must be straight, showing little or no appearance of ankle in front. They should be strong in bone throughout, short and straight in pastern. Both fore and hind legs should be carried straight forward in traveling, the stifles not turning outward. The elbows should hang perpendicularly to the body, working free of the sides. Feet should be round, compact, and not large. The soles hard and tough, the toes moderately arched, and turned neither in nor out. Coat should be smooth, flat, but hard, dense, and abundant. The belly and underside of the thighs should not be bare. Color. White should predominate. Brindle, red, or liver markings are objectionable. Otherwise, this point is of little or no importance. Symmetry, size, and character. The dog must present a generally gay, lively, and active appearance. Bone and strength in small compass are essentials, but this must not be taken to mean that a fox terrier should be cloggy or in any way coarse speed and endurance must be looked to as well as power, and the symmetry of the foxhound taken as a model. The terrier, like the hound, must on no account be leggy, nor must he be too short in the leg. He should stand like a cleverly made hunter, covering a lot of ground, yet with a short back, as before stated. He will then attain the highest degree of propelling power, together with the greatest length of stride, that is compatible with the length of his body. Weight is not a certain criterion of a terrier's fitness for his work, general shape, size, and contour are the main points, and if a dog can gallop and stay and follow his fox up a drain it matters little what his weight is to a pound or so though roughly speaking it may be said that he should not scale over twenty pounds in show condition wire-haired fox terrier this variety of the breed should resemble the smooth sort in every respect except the coat which should be broken the harder and more wiry the texture of the coat is, the better. On no account should the dog look or feel woolly, and there should be no silky hair about the pole or anywhere else. The coat should not be too long, so as to give the dog a shaggy appearance, but at the same time it should show a marked and distinct difference all over from the smooth species. The premier honors in the dog classes of the earliest shows were divided, in the main, between the four great terriers, Jock, Trap, Tartar, and Rattler. The first two became celebrated at stud, Jock succeeding principally through the female line, while Trap was successful through both male and female. Both Trap's and Jock's pedigrees are obscure, but their origin as far as deciphered, points strongly to the Grove Kennels strain of terriers, and while white, with but little markings, it has always claimed the black and tan ran in their veins. The combination of these two great dogs gave to the fancy a host of terriers, which made their mark at stud and on the bench, and which figure today in most of the pedigrees of the prize-winning strains. Tyrant, by Old Trap, out of Violet, by Old Jock, was the sire of Chance, who, bred to a daughter of Old Jock, gave to the terrier world Trixie, the dam of Brockenhurst Joe and Champion Olive, son and daughter of the Belgrave Joe, a Belvoir breed terrier, Brockenhurst Joe, who passed his last days in this country, more than any other dog is responsible through his son Brockenhurst Raleigh for the celebrated strain of the Messrs. Clark of Nottingham. It includes, among its enormous list of winners, Result, pronounced by competent judges as the best terrier of modern times. Champion Olive produced Pickle the Second, who, while not a show terrier, 
was the sire of more successful brood bitches than any dog in the annals of fox terrier breeding olive was also the dam of champion spice of whom more later jock's only descendants in the female line which command our interest today was through his grandson jester the second the sire of many a good one while the strain has rather poor woolly coats and indifferent heads it possesses great character gameness and excellent bone champion bedlamite the dam of bacchanal now the property of mr john a logan jr of youngstown ohio is a daughter of jester the second's son joker bacchanal possesses probably the truest terrier character of any dog we have on this side of the atlantic tartar while successful in a measure as a sire cannot be classed with the first two as a great progenitor of today's breed perhaps his best strain is the one which came through his son trophy the grandsire of corinthian a dog which produced so many good ones that his blood became at one time a very popular and successful one they were noted for the rapid maturity but as they advanced in years tended to grow coarse and thick in the head most of their bench honors were acquired during their puppyhood and early maturity mr fred hoy's champion valet however who is directly of this strain and is now quite well along in his years is a marked exception retaining his form wonderfully his incurable and unaccountable impotence has been a very great loss to american breeders the tartars are all game as wild cats old trophy who passed his last days with sir bache cunard's hounds in leicestershire sported but half a jaw having lost the other half to a badger sir bache told me that this dog remained unconquerably game to his last hour i owned a lovely bitch nelly whom i brought home in eighteen seventy six by old tartar said to have been out of the hon t w fitzwilliams nettle she bred me some extraordinarily game terriers to bismarck a son of the marquis of huntley's bounce he a son of old trap and the grandsire of the peerless buffet she also bred me some good ones to a son of hogniston joe and fairy the dam of mixture whom i got from mr murchison in 1878 i have no more of this strain and while not quite as good for the bench as my present prize winners they were true terriers and would be invaluable to me today to infuse great character and gameness in my kennels from a bench show point of view tyke was undoubtedly tartar's best son he never did very much at stud and owing to the line coats which appeared in this line of blood there is a strong suspicion of a cross of bull terriers somewhere shovel a son of tartar's good son trumps is now in california and possessing as he does an infusion of belvoir blood ought to do good service in improving the breed on the pacific coast rattler the fourth of the early great terriers mentioned above represented nothing but a brilliant personal career he was a failure at stud his antecedents were cloudy and yet he for many years was invincible on the bench a strain which every breeder to-day cannot fail to wish to know about considering its phenomenal success through such dogs as splinter and all of his famous sons headed by lucifer and female descendants headed by the great vesuvian and including champion diana and diadem the last two having for some years figured as american matrons is the foiler strain its origin is principally from the grove terriers foiler being by old grip a son of grove willie out of judy one of rev jack russell's strain the characteristics of the strain are excellent heads legs and feet 
In the latter point these Terriers, as an average, excel all others. They are prone, however, to drooping quarters, hind dew claws, and, if bred in closely, large ears. The foilers are the most difficult of all to handle in breeding, but with care I prefer them to all others. They are well represented in this country by a number of stud dogs. Lucifer, Dusky Trap, and Splogger are direct descendants of the male line from the old dog. Perhaps the most important of all are the Belvoir Terriers. About sixteen years ago, Belgrave Joe began to attract attention as a sire, and from Mr. Luke Tanner's and Mr. Murchison's kennels came a host of winners. These terriers were essentially of the Belvoir kennel strain. Every pedigree today, whether of one family or another, is thoroughly saturated with this blood. Freer from bull cross than any others, it greatly changed the type of the winning terriers when widely introduced, and with its extraordinary ability to stand successful inbreeding, it may be said to have done more to disseminate a good average terrier than any other strain. It brought symmetry, character, and good coats, although more profuse than before, and it was not until the advent of Champion Spice, with his doubtful lineage on his dam's side, that a branch of the Belvoir strain, through him, went all to pieces as regards their jackets. The tremendous opportunities given this very good dog at stud resulted in a very few good ones. Mixture, Brockenhurst Spice, Earl Leicester, and Hysop were about the best. His blood, however, with careful handling and tempered with that of strains of more fixity of type, helped produce Rachel, First Flight, syrup raffle chattox and a host of others in the second third and fourth generations spice was brought to america in eighteen eighty six by mr kelly of new york at the largest price ever paid by an american exhibitor his career was very short after doing but little service in the stud he lost his life in a fight with one of mr kelly's deer hounds within the year so that what spice blood we have in this country did not come to us directly from him. Earl Lecheser, his kennel companion, was disposed of in the same way by Mr. Kelly's Grecian Greyhound last year. Mixture is in Mr. John E. Thayer's kennels at Lancaster, Massachusetts, where he has done excellent service in the stud. Just at this moment, a strain is becoming of special interest. It is the Buffer. Through his grandson Buff, at one time much thought of, but of recent years little used and often much abused. The Buffers were always accused of possessing a cross of Beagle, which brought them heavy, listless ears and a want of true character. I must say my own experience with blood akin to it gave me some results of that very sort. Buffer was the son of the Marquis of Huntley's Bounce, and the dog I used with my tartar bitch Nelly, spoken of already in this article, was also a son of his, called Bismarck. Ten years ago, a friend of mine and I also tried inbreeding for three generations. The marked features above alluded to cropped out now and then, although I will acknowledge one dog, a real terrier, was a game, big brute, and weighed 33 pounds. Buffer produced Buffett, claimed by competent judges to have been the most perfectly built fox terrier that has to their knowledge existed. He sired little of great value outside of his famous son, Buff. This white dog, possessing wonderful legs and feet, great character, and symmetry had a very successful career on the bench and was extensively used at stud his gat was only fair with the exception of two beautiful daughters bloom and blossom buff was cursed with periodical attacks of eczema and this with the fact that careless use of his blood and attempts at inbreeding 
brought out large ears and bad heads, soon caused his blood to be discarded for the more successful families that followed his period. Certainly what Buff produced for Mr. Lawrence to Jeopardy, and some other bitches in this country, was not good. I had a bitch inbred to him, with which I never succeeded in rearing a fit puppy to escape the stable pail. Messrs. Rutherford had a nice little son of Buff, called Naylor, who got some very neat terriers, such as they were in America at the time he figured on our benches. Mr. Gushing of Boston has, however, today a very useful dog by Buff, out of jeopardy. If anyone desires the old dog's blood, I dare say his services might be obtained. True, Buff enters into the Clark strain through Rollick, but it only appears as a small and useful ingredient. Where, however, today we see this blood jump suddenly to the front is through Mrs. Vickery's kennels. Its cross with the foilers through splinter in his hands has given us Vesuvian and Venio. The extent to which the latter is being used at stud, and I hear with success, and the fact that that I have four young sons of his out of Rachel coming on who are likely, or accidents, to disseminate the blood in this country, makes the study of this fortunate combination interesting. The simplest way is to give an extended pedigree of the cross, and by it will be seen how, through Foiler, on the sire, Vesuvian's side, a little brother of Lucifer's, the blood of Rollick predominates. Buff, on the dam Vanilla's side, appears through an inbred cross. To conclude the subject of the different strains of blood among fox terriers, I have selected the Clark or Brockenhurst Rally strain, because it is the most distinct in type, because it has, in a given period, produced more high-class bitch winners than any other, and because it furnishes the best example of a most carefully worked out instance of successful inbreeding known to fox terrier history. The Messrs. Clark, two brothers living in Nottingham, founded the family with practically three terriers, one dog, and two bitches. The dog was Brockenhurst Raleigh, an excellent son of Brockenhurst Joe and Moss the Second a granddaughter of old white tyrant. The bitches were Jess, a daughter of Hazelhurst's grip, he a son of Turk, out of Patch, a granddaughter of Old Trap, and Rollick, a daughter of Buff and Nectar the second, by Old Foiler. Brockenhurst Raleigh was bred to both Jess and Rollick. The offspring of these two unions were bred together for several generations, and this crossing and recrossing the two precisely the same blood is what produced result, and all the terriers so closely related to him, including Royster, Regent, Reckoner, Rachel, Radiance, Reckon, Rational, Raffle, etc., which for the last six years have held almost undisputed sway on the English benches. It was but last year that they finally succumbed to Mr. Vickery's kennels. Although Russell Toff, the best puppy of this year, and purchased by Mr. F. Redmond from his breeder Mr. F. W. F. Tomer of Swindon for two hundred guineas, is essentially of the Brockenhurst Raleigh family. Now and then an outcross was made, such as that to hice up the best-fronted son of Spice from which came Heatherbell and Harmony, respectively, the dams of Rachel and Raffle, and to New Forest, the son of Splinter and Olive the second, from which cross first flight was the fruit. Reckoner is also credited with one outcross in his grand dam Nell, a bitch of foiler and buff blood. In the main, however, the Clark Terriers trace to Brockenhurst Rally and the two bitches Jess and Rollick. Here there appears a complicated multi-page lineage chart, the family tree of this breed. It is undoubtedly Brockenhurst Raleigh's Bevor blood, as well as the care and intelligence of Messrs. Clark's 
handling which has permitted the inbreeding of these terriers to be so remarkably successful the striking features of the clark terriers are a tendency to uniformity in markings all black or black with very little tan markings on the head predominating white bodies of course or white bodies with black patches accompanying a high average of well carried and exceptionally small ears a smooth outline their muscles being beautifully distributed and showing no bossiness excellent coats legs and feet grand ribs and loin and they are from my own experience very game and good workers their peculiarities naturally appear persistently and are domed skulls shoulders not oblique enough and consequently a tendency to stand out at the elbows thereby sometimes in the judging ring throwing away well-deserved prizes before a judge fastidious on the question of narrow and straight fronts returning to russelly toff a dog i have not seen but which my kennel manager mr german hopkins saw when abroad last spring and as carefully described to me i should judge to be a dog with all the best features of the clark terriers and with neither of their prominent faults that is to say domed skull or indifferent shoulders toff is a beautifully fronted dog in fact that would have to be the case for mr redmond to own him he being uncompromisingly wedded to that most important of all points in a fox terrier toff's outcross is however right back into the blood the messrs clark drew from he is by stipendiary a son of rachel's son reckon out of shendy a granddaughter on both sides of belgrave joe his dam is by regent out of rutty rutty is by brockenhurst joe raleigh's sire out of a granddaughter of champion olive the sister of brockenhurst joe he will thus be seen that there is still reason to expect this great strain to hold its own in the front rank although as it is the world over the latest champion is always the most popular american breeders while not having as yet produced a result or a vesuvian have really a most excellent collection of terriers to breed from including practically every strain of consequence the blood of jock trap and tartar first came to us through the importation by mr newbold morris of a very fair terrier called gamester in eighteen seventy seven he produced quite a number of nice puppies at the time but his blood has now quite disappeared from our benches nothing very serious was done in getting out high-class terriers until the messrs lawrence of Groton, massachusetts and messrs rutherford of almachi warren county new jersey began exhibiting about the year eighteen eighty two mr lawrence bought old buff and brockenhurst joe and some nice bitches including jeopardy and deacon rosie from mr j c ten for three or four years these terriers and their offspring adorned our benches but unfortunately mr lawrence's kennels being far away from the principal breeders of the time the old dogs received comparatively few outside bitches when they died four years ago mr lawrence to the great regret of our fanciers gave up active breeding messrs rutherford made some very useful importations beginning in eighteen eighty one including old bowstring by turk swansden by saracen old champion royal and a number of crosses of buff among them nailer by buff imported in utero and later old viola the granddam of their famous bitch diana the blood of the earlier importations has given away to the modern strains with which they have liberally sprinkled their kennels diana splogger raffle and cornwall duchess being the most prominent of their own while they have availed themselves unstintingly of every stud dog accessible to them in swansden by saracen a strain came to us which i have not mentioned and which possesses some local interest for us 
that is to say, the Turk. This dog, at one time quite popular in England, a son of old Grip, and with probably a predominance of grove blood in him, got two sons, litter brothers, who were used considerably, Muslim and Saracen. The strain was noted for gameness. Muslim produced a coarse branch, while Saracen's get showed quality. A son of Moslem, Moslem the second, was brought to this country and received much unmerited puffing. He was a fair dog, of rather common mold. Fortunately for American breeders, his moderate career on our benches was short, and our breeders escaped his undesirable blood at stud. Swansdon, by Saracen, on the other hand, bred to Brockenhurst Joe, produced Warren Lady, the dam of General Grant, a very credible terrier, in his early maturity. She was also the dam of a lively bitch, Lady Warren Mixture, by Mixture, which Mrs. Rutherford lost through distemper. Barring a delicate constitution, she was quite the prettiest quality bitch bred on this side. Mr. James Mortimer, of the Westminster Kennel Club, Babylon, Long Island, one of our best judges and a very successful breeder, from Swanston's blood got his excellent puppy, Suffolk Risk, by Raffle. Shortly after the importation of Brockhurst Joe and Buff by Mr. Lawrence, Mr. John E. Thayer of Lancaster, Massachusetts, brought out the then-famous Richmond Olive and Rabby Tyrant at the highest prices at that time paid by American breeders. Founding with these two terriers, his celebrated hillside kennels of fox terriers. They can hardly be said to represent a strain. They represent rather a combination of blood with which Mr. George Raber, a very clever breeder in England, had much success. But both Olive and Rabbi Tyrant seem to have failed to produce themselves or any very remarkable terriers on this side of the water. Mr. Thayer later added Mixture, Belgrave Primrose, Reckoner, and Richmond Dazzle to his kennels, amid a large draft from Mr. Fred Hoey's kennels. With this additional blood, Mr. Thayer is bringing out very creditable youngsters. Mr. Fred Hoey, whose kennels are at Hollywood, Long Branch, New Jersey, one of our good judges and a keen and intelligent breeder, has been very successful with a smaller kennel than those named above. From Lorette, a sister of Spice in Olive the Second, the dam of New Forest, he bred a lovely bitch Mace the Second to Brockenhurst Joe, which unfortunately died of distemper after the Boston show of 1886. Most of his terriers have come from Mr. Vickery's kennels, including his famous valet, his sire Venetian, and some recent importations of the strains closely related to Vesuvian's blood. Mr. Edward Kelly of New York, the founder of our Fox Terrier Club, and a liberal importer of many good terriers of the Belvoir strains, has done much for our American Fox Terrier family. Of recent years, he has not been as active, owing to business cares absorbing his leisure. The debt American breeders owe him must nevertheless not be forgotten. Mr. Clarence Rathbone of Albany must be counted as one of the faithful of the faithful. His Beverwick Kennels of Albany, New York, contain representatives of every known strain, and in the hands of so enthusiastic and tireless a breeder a vast amount of good work is being done, which should surely one of these days be crowned with the breeding of some clinkers. With my own, the Blimpton Kennels, ends the list of our kennels of importance up to within two years. Since then, enthusiastic breeders have started kennels, of which much will be heard in the near future. Mr. R. S. Ryan of Baltimore has drawn both from our best home kennels and also somewhat from abroad to found his Linden Kennels. Messrs. Granger and Van der Poel's Regent Kennels in Baltimore also give great promise. Active and keen, their kennels are destined to be a creditable support to our leading shows. 
A strong and enthusiastic combination has been formed by two young breeders of means, Mr. Moses Taylor and Mr. James T. Burden, Jr., of New York. Their kennels are known as the Wooddale Kennels at Wooddale, near Troy, on the Hudson. They spare neither time nor expense, and will soon appear on our benches with good strings to compete with the old kennels, who must now look to their laurels, for all these newly organized kennels are on the right track as far as the blood they possess is concerned. Mr. John A. Logan, Jr., of Youngstown, Ohio, is another of our very best new breeders. With his already wide experience with dogs and horses, being an excellent sportsman and fond of the best of everything in quadrupeds, his Oriole kennels will certainly become familiar to every fox terrier lover in the country. A very important importation has been made this year by Mr. H. E. Astor Carey of New York a new acquisition to the fancy he brought out first flight new forest best son a dog combining the splinter and spice cross with the clark strain also a full sister of champion rachel and one or two other excellent brood bitches mr carey's kennels cannot fail to meet with success with such blood to begin with on the Pacific coast, the fancy is represented by such breeders as Mr. J. B. Martin, San Francisco, California, Mr. C. A. Sumner, Los Angeles, California, while throughout the country are scattered lovers of the breed, a list of some of which I subjoin, and all of which are doing their good work. Mr. W. T. McAleys, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Mr. John Wren, Springfield, Ohio, Mr. Lloyd Banks, New York City, Mr. W. H. Jokel, Jr., New York City, Mr. Louis A. Biddle, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Mr. G. S. Kissel, Morristown, New Jersey, Mr. Warham Whitney, Rochester, New York, Carl Heimerley, Bay Ridge, Long Island, New York. Our Canadian cousins have for years had an excellent list of active and intelligent fanciers, and in their kennels can be found the blood of their own viable importations of prominent strains from england and from our best kennels in the united states such well-known breeders and exhibitors as mr richard gibson of delaware ontario messrs wheeler and davy of london ontario mr d s booth of brockville ontario and mr j k Macdonald of toronto need no praise from me it has frequently been claimed that show terriers are wanting in courage as compared with terriers of former days this is a common cant among sportsmen not interested in bench shows it is true that a terrier not trained for his work will frequently disappoint an owner just as a setter or pointer of the very best strain would disappoint a sportsman in the field if its natural instincts had not been cultivated by training. In proof of the claim that there has been no deterioration in fox terriers, if properly bred, I received permission from Mr. Royal P. Carroll of New York, one of our well-known sportsmen, who has just returned from the West, to relate a little incident told him by Mr. Beck, son of Senator Beck of Kentucky, showing what fox terriers are capable of if put to the test. Mr. Beck, who has a ranch near Cheyenne, Wyoming, some years ago purchased some of the Blimpton Kennels Terriers, from which he has since bred quite a pack. Mr. Beck was out with his terriers one day, and ran across a good-sized cinnamon bear, which the terriers promptly attacked. Of course, it was out of the question that they should come out better than second best. They made a very creditable fight, however, and were treated to a violent repulse, which they succumbed to as reluctantly as the most exacting critic could wish. End of section 22. Recording by William Jones.